one of the most tragic things that continues to happen under their system is that people who are fortunate enough to survive uh, life-threatening experiences, whether that be a stroke or cancer or, or whatever, they find themselves uh, getting through that and then being released and being hit with these bills. And there are just terrifying numbers of uh, people who then end up going into uh, medically related bankruptcy. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 216 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience with a stroke and you have been thinking about reaching out to be a guest on the show, but we're waiting for the right time, this is it. If you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, you will find a form that you could fill out to apply to be a guest on the show. Now, when I say apply, everyone who applies to be a guest on the show basically gets on. There's no application process that's difficult. Basically, if you've had a stroke or you care for somebody that's had a stroke or you know somebody that's had a stroke, you will qualify to be on the show. Now, as soon as I receive your request, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you and me to meet over Zoom. And then that'll be it. You'll be on the show. Now, also, I would love to hear from people that have had any stroke-related questions and they would like my perspective on their question. Uh, I'd love to make some short episodes that give my perspective on whatever you are curious about. Now, they can't be medical questions in nature as I'm not a doctor and I cannot comment on your specific situation, but there can be general questions that are around stroke and stroke-related matters. So once again, if you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact in the subject field, you will see a drop down. And if you choose ask Bill a question option, then you can fill out the details. And when I have enough questions, I will answer them in a episode dedicated to those questions. Now, my guest today is author of the book titled Stroke, A 5% Chance of Survival. And Ricky Monaghan Brown must have a world record for high blood pressure because I've never heard of a reading so high. And more importantly, I've never had somebody live to tell the story of a reading so high. This is a great episode. I hope you enjoy it. Ricky Monaghan Brown, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here all the way from Ireland. Edinburgh, Scotland. Edinburgh, Scotland. Okay, fantastic. Good to Where have it you. Is. Where it is, 5.30 in the morning. Oh, man, <laughs> thank you so much then. I really appreciate it. I could have done a bit later if I'd known, but look, thank you so much. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Well, um, we were just talking about... Uh, you're making sure that the podcast is reasonably PG. So what my wife tends to tell people is that um, she and I had, well, let me start from the beginning because um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a great, it wasn't a great uh, week for me actually, because this would be in a, in a, in about a, in a couple of weeks, this will be 10 years ago now. And uh, I had just on a Friday lost my job as a finance lawyer in Manhattan, in New York City. Uh, and we had, uh, you know, we were sort of just trying to take it easy. I hadn't managed to get a, a new job. Things were uh, things weren't great, so we went to my 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 now wife and I and uh, my daughter went out to the, uh, the science museum. We had a kind of, uh, oh, you know, we, we had a fun day. Um, and then we dropped my, uh, my daughter off with her mother. We, we were tooling around in our, on our little um, pink moped, our little pink Malaguri scooter. Um, we played a bit of pool. We'd had a couple of drinks. Uh, we'd had like, some of the best pizza in the five bars. Uh, and we, we went home and we were, we were just sort of rounding the night off, I suppose. Um, you know, trying to make the uh, the best of things a fairly stressful time. 
And uh, when people ask her what happened, Beth tends to say, well, if you're going to choose the way you wanted to go, how would you choose to go? <laughs> oh. I tend to, <laughs> you see where I'm going with this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I tend to say um, we were engaged in vigorous nighttime activity. And uh, I think other people would call it horizontal jogging. Uh-huh. So um, I found that I had um, a sort of tingling sensation in my left arm. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that to Beth. We, we took a little break. And she was saying that, um, you know, don't worry. You know, just have a rest, have a drink of water. This will pass. Um, and I, I was I, I was optimistic, and uh, I think the the last thing I I said to her was, before I lost consciousness was, um, "Don't worry, everything's going to be fine." And I I, 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 I I had, as I was saying that, I was I thought I, I thought I was going to die, um, but uh, I. Uh, uh, but 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 I believed it, and then yes, sort of seen. Um, I don't really remember anything directly for another seven weeks. I don't think. Wow. So yes, hemorrhagic stroke. To be clear, so it, it wasn't a clot based stroke. It was a it was a burst blood vessel in the in, in the brain. Do we know the reason why the blood vessel burst? What was the underlying cause? Well, it was ah well yes actually this is a really sort of good message to to get across to people as it happens. So I'd been working this in extremely um, intense uh, lifestyle whereby I was working lots of late nights, lots of weekends, um, and also not really looking after myself the way I should because I also uh, there's a, there's a history of high blood pressure in my, my family. Um, my father had had a couple of uh, coronaries many years earlier at this point. Uh, and um, because of the sort of um, the stress uh, and the, you were under the, at the I, time, mm-hmm. I had ceased to keep up my blood pressure medication. Oh. So, yeah, so they discovered when they, just after they pulled me into uh, the local teaching hospital, which fortunately was only about three blocks away. Um, they kept on taking my, in fact, even the, even before we got there, when the, uh, when the paramedics came to the flat, they kept on ta- retaking my blood pressure because they didn't believe it was real. It was something over 300 over something over 200, which I can wow. tell from looking at your face, you realize it's enough to kill two men. <laughs> that's enough to kill an army. I mean, that's, the highest reading I've ever heard of, and I, I've had a lot of these high blood pressure type stroke podcast interviews, and of that course. is, and everyone has been around 200, you know, 210, 220, but above 300, this is an absolute miracle that you're here. Yeah. I'm number one. <laughs> you, man. Well done. I mean, that's amazing. That's just absolutely amazing. Uh, so... I'm gonna because I'm because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a simple man. I'd love to know how did you get from your bed to uh, was it an ambulance? Were you did they clothe you? Did they just throw a towel over you? Or do you know <laughs> detail? How did you get from the state you were in to yeah. elsewhere? Yeah. Um- well, I, 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 I think um, I think they managed to sort of drape me in, in something or other. But yes, it, it, it was an ambulance. We, again, we were very fortunate. Three blocks, three blocks from the hospital. So I was, I was being, uh, I was being wheeled into into the hospital. You know, within about three minutes of um, of this all starting. So uh, yeah, that's and 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 then you know straight onto gurney and. The funny thing is, uh, I've, I've been, as I'm sure a lot of people do, I've been, I've been back to that hospital, even though I live about three thousand miles away now. It's, it, 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 it's amazing how calm that place generally is. Uh, but uh, apparently, uh, things were, things were pretty hectic as they were, as they were feeling near. Yeah. What was it like? So you, now you're at hospital, 
How long before yep. you come around? How long before do they operate? What happens? How do they get this thing under control? They wanted to go straight into, into surgery and um, do some reasonably serious intervention because they, they, they couldn't do anything to, to get the blood pressure under control. It was so, it was so wild, obviously. Um, but the partic- but the, you know, the, the particular expert surgeon who would, have, who would have been doing that job wasn't going to be available until first thing in the, the actual morning. The proper people have been to bed and gone up morning. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, when, when, when he arrived, um, the, the, they did um, a, a trephination or a trepanning. So essentially, I've still got two burr holes in my head, which um, Beth and I quite enjoy allowing people to touch because it, it freaks them out, as you know, you know, I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so essentially they drilled two burr holes in the top of my skull to release the pressure. Um, and that was, that was sort of the, 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 the first step uh, towards um, keeping me alive. Uh-huh. Although, um, you know, one of Beth's, um, you know, every, everyone's story is, is dramatic and we are living in the future and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make out, you know, my story special in some way. But, uh, yeah, one of our best friends was a very, um, very accomplished uh, ear, nose, and throat surgeon, as it happens. And he he went back to Beth's flatmate and said, this is it. You're you're not going to see this guy again. We're, we're done. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's how that, that's how that was going down. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, so, so what happened? So, did, did, I, I should answer your question. Um I don't really remember. All of this stuff has been related to me. I don't. Uh, I don't have any first-hand experience of this uh, for about another seven weeks, and then something kind of uh, poetic happened. I'm, I'm a writer now, so I, I love this. Um, as I say, this was ten years ago. So um, I don't know if you if you would have had this on your news, but there was something called Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy. Yes. Hit New York City, yeah. So um, almost all of the um, the city lost almost all of its power. In fact, in hospitals dotted around the city, um, nurses were carrying newborn babies up and down stairs because lifts weren't working and all that sort of stuff. And there's this very striking picture of Manhattan where you can see this line that's sort of almost all the way down all of Manhattan. And on one side, all the lights are off. And on the other side, all the lights are on, which, you know, for a stroke patient is, um, you know, an image we could all recognize, I think. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was in a hospital. All the lights were off. Everyone, and of course, we're in a hospital full of people with brain injuries and strokes. So they're very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very sort of highly stressed as it is. So we were all sort of kind of in a, in a bad place. But then, weirdly enough, when the lights went back on in the hospital and the lights went back on uh, across Manhattan, Beth tells me that was when the lights went on for me. Uh, that's the point at which I started uh, you know, beginning to have um, slightly more coherent interactions with people mm-hmm. and, or, or, or really any sort of useful interaction at all. So that's, that's when things came together seven weeks later. It, it's a pretty cool story. I mean, I know you tried to downplay it, but it, it is pretty cool. You you had a you had blood pressure through the roof. Um, you were in a certain situation while that was happening. You were about to experience most men's dreams. You know, go going the way. You know, there's that that that's the best way to go. Apparently, um, for you maybe uh, it would have been <laughs> maybe not. Um, for your partner, it would not have been. Um, and it happened that everything kind of, even after that sort of catastrophe, everything kind of went right so that you can get to be here 10 years down the track and moved on. And you've still got the things, you know, the holes in your head and you're talking and you're a writer now. And like, it's a pretty big turnaround from that to where you are now. So it is dramatic. And people that are listening, and watching, I want to also acknowledge them because 
they've had a pretty dramatic turnaround, even though they might be earlier on in their uh, in their story than your eye or further along. Um, there is still a dramatic turnaround. There is an amazing amount of things that they've overcome, resilience that they've had to find, uh, et cetera, to be here. And it's no mean feat because, you know, we don't have those skills before stroke. We got no idea what to do at, in the event of a stroke because we don't have those skills. We've got no idea. So you'll have to learn it, grow, overcome all on your own in one, you know, from one minute to the next. You've got to expand yourself as a human being to learn the things that you need to do to continuously remain above ground and also to then start somehow moving back into some type of existence that you can experience a new normal or a level of normality that works for you or for your family or whatever. So it's a bloody big deal. I want to acknowledge that firstly. Um, but secondly, I had my stroke in 2012 as well. I was in New York uh, at the end of 2012. Uh, we saw the new year in uh, between 2012 and 2013. Uh, and we were there just after Hurricane Sandy in November, I think it was Hurricane Sandy. And then in December, they were doing the cleanup and things were getting better. And it was a really good time because it was the weather was nice and settled. All the bad weather had been and gone and people were... We, we really experienced New York well. The fact that I was in New York for New Year's Eve was a, a the most amazing accomplishment of my life. It was just mm -hmm. ridiculously amazing that two months, you know, that at the beginning of the year, I had the first bleed, I had the second bleed, and then I somehow dragged myself to get to the point where I was good enough overcome all my fears to get on a plane and, and do a 24-hour trip from the ass end of the world, as they call Australia sometimes, to the other side of the world to be, <laughs> to be in uh, New York. I mean, it, it's a massive feat for both me and my family. I was afraid when I was there that it might happen again while I'm overseas. I bought the most expensive insurance that I could possibly get, so I was completely covered if in the event that it happened. And even though I thought that it might happen while I was there, we went anyway. We weren't going to not go. And that's not something that I had ever done before. This is the part of me that I didn't know existed that I had to discover until after these damn strokes occurred, you know. So how long did it take you to then get out of hospital and what were you left with that you had to overcome? Yeah, well... Um that would have been that, that, so. That was that was seven weeks. Uh, I was uh, I was it, there was three and a half weeks in the in the local hospital, just three blocks from where we lived in in Brooklyn, um, in uh, sort of very intensive care. Uh, and I have I have I have no memory of that. Uh, and then after the three and a half weeks, um, it was very, very important. Um, all of the medical team thought uh, correctly, obviously. Um, to get me into as intense a rehabilitation as they could. So I was moved into Manhattan where uh, they started work on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the rehabilitation. And I suppose, uh, and I, I, was, I was very fortunate. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, you, you, make, you make the good point about the, about the amount of um, kudos we have to give a lot of the people who will be seeing this podcast um, for, you know, being in a position where they're able to watch it. Uh, the, so, so the, the, there is that. But for, for, for me personally, um, I tend to be very uh, cognizant of the ridiculous amount of um, luck that's involved here because I'm I'm in physically and mentally pretty decent shape. You know, there are deficits, of course, um, but you know, I, I'm I'm no special. I had, a, I had a great deal of luck, and that's a huge part of it. And, and, and people who don't have as, as, as great outcomes, that, that's bad luck and, that, and that's, that's tragic. And I, 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 I give them more respect than anyone else because they're, you know, they're getting on with things and that's amazing. Yeah. And I also have to acknowledge the crazy amount of help that we got. I mean, firstly, myself personally from Beth and then all of our friends 
and our families and, and the incredible medical team as well. So, um, again, very fortunate in that regard. But I think when you talk about your trip to, um, to New York for, uh, for New Year, I think you're touching on something really important there as well. I don't know the extent to which you were thinking about or focusing on that trip when you were going through your strokes and all that sort of stuff. But we, one of the things that I think helped us get through this experience was trying to picture a future. Um, you know, even so, something as simple as the idea of walking through uh, Prospect Park again, just, just sort of being able to sort of cling on to that possibility. Um, and, and, and I, I started fantasizing about the idea of uh, running a marathon or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it would have been two years later, we we're back in Scotland and I ran the, uh, the Isla half marathon sponsored by the brilliant Scotch whiskey makers at Ardbeg. So that, that, that was a wonderful thing to be able to do, but being able to sort of focus these things and, and sort of try to imagine the good times was a really, a really important thing for us. I like that. I like that. It's like, it's like you're setting an intention for something that you're a goal that you need to work towards. And I, I like that. And we didn't have a goal per se that was deadline uh, driven. It was just driven by location. We're going to get there one day. And I felt like that was better because then I didn't have, if I didn't make it, then I wouldn't have been, then I felt like I would have been more disappointed if the goal to get there by the deadline wasn't achieved, right? So the fact yeah. that we did have something to look forward to made us get through the the real bad times, the many, many bad times that we had. Um, so yeah, I, I like that idea of planning a future regardless of how dire things may be because they do motivate you to an extent. It does motive, it's motivational to have something that's in the future to work towards. And that's kind of when you learn about yourself, where you overcome all the deficits. And I'm not talking about just the ones that stroke created. I'm also talking about the ones that we create in our mind every day, which are not, which are imagined that are not even real, you know, uh, physical deficits, but then we manifest them as being real and then we get in our own way. Um, so I love that. And then you, you lost your job. Sounds like at exactly the right time because then you didn't have to worry about going back to work. Uh, and you didn't have to worry about your employers. However, that would have been a difficult time as well because I imagine were you covered by insurance or anything so that was it okay that you weren't working for a little while? What was that like? Uh, yeah, it wasn't great. Um, so because um, I had, you know, just at, almost at, you know, just immediately before that moment because that, that had been when my employment properly terminated, um, I was not at that point. It wasn't looking like I was, I was, I was, I was going to be covered. Um, unfortunately, um, you, they have a, they have another uh, aspect of, of health insurance uh, in the U S called a Cobra or Cobra, which essentially means that you can maintain the health insurance that you had for a period of time. So long, as, so long as you pay a particular amount of the premium. So you don't have to pay the full premium, which um, would have been just something that would have been impossible for us to manage, uh, but, but, but a smaller amount. Um, having said that, well, I suppose the first thing to note is that uh, at the end of that seven-week period, uh, the retail cost of my health care to that point was $600,000. Um, Whoa. so we were, we were very fortunate. We managed to get uh, the Cobra into effect, and then we were able to. I mean, Beth was, was working at this point herself, so she was just about able to, to cover that. Um, until such time as when we saw so actually, my, my, my stroke um, would have been, and, and actually, Sandy originally happened uh, in October, so my stroke was September, October, 
in fact, just as the just as the calendar was turning, which made it difficult to answer the questions, like you know, what 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 what's your name? When did your stroke happen? Um, all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, Beth then lost her job just in the just around about Christmas time um, because you know she wasn't she wasn't able necessarily to live up to the expectations of a, a New York investment bank while also trying to trying to look after me. Uh, so by the turn of the year, um, things were looking very grim and bleak again. Um, and we had to make the, the, the decision to move here to Scotland uh, because I was going to, I was, I was, I was still going to be uh, eligible for um, NHS care over here. Uh, and it, it actually, I suppose in the same vein as you know these things that we we use as tools to look forward to, it had always been sort of our idea to move to Scotland. Um, as it happens, Beth's birthday uh, is uh, is Burns Night, and her family's best friends were Scots, all that sort of stuff. And I'd always thought about I I I'd originally always thought that I would move back at some point. In fact, when I first moved to America. Uh, permanently, I was thinking, oh, you know, a couple of years and then go home. And of course, 15 years pass and you've got a mortgage and you've got a kid and all that sort of stuff and um, things don't really happen. But yeah, the, uh, the, the the way we got through the insurance question in the end was uh, moving back to Scotland uh, about, about 10 years ago now. So yeah, yeah very different life now. So you've got the NHS experience, the National Health Service in mm. the United Kingdom. Uh, what kind of level of coverage does that give you? Um, in Australia, we've got the Medicare system, and the Medicare system covers anybody who doesn't have insurance for everything. And there's yep. you walk out of hospital with zero costs, other than perhaps uh, you know a, a fifty or sixty dollar medication prescription that you have to buy on the way out. Um, and all of my healthcare, all of my surgery, all of my MRIs, all of my rehabilitation was just on on the taxpayer who I'm one of and I contribute to the uh, Medicare levy that we're charged um, uh, annually. Uh, so what's it like in Britain and then what would have happened if you couldn't pay 600 grand in the US? Yeah, um, well, so firstly, then, the, the experience here with the NHS is that healthcare uh, across the UK is uh, free at the point of service, free at the point of access. So uh, basically all of our payments for, uh, for healthcare just come directly through tax. Um, it, it, it's, it's slightly different across the different nations of the UK whereby uh, prescriptions, for example, in Scotland are also free. Uh, that's a decision that's been made by our devolved government. Uh, I think in England and Wales, prescription, you have to pay for your pres- a certain amount of your prescriptions. Um, there, and I, 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 there, there, there has been a levy uh, across parts of the UK uh, in recent years, but I believe our new Prime Minister is going to be going to be taking that away. So, um, yeah, free the point of service, which is amazing. Uh, I read a thing a while ago um, about how one of the good things about the NHS being held up by the population here as a sort of uh, a foundational pillar of the way that we live, notwithstanding the fact it's under a lot of stress, is that it's because the, the British people love the NHS, it gives them this sort of um, grounding in an idea that all, all lives have value, um, which I suppose brings me to the next part of your, your, your question regarding what would have happened um, if we hadn't been able to, say, say, get on Cobra and then get back into a place where we, were, where we had access to, uh, to free healthcare at the point of delivery. In the US, um, one of the most tragic things that continues to happen under their system is that people who are fortunate enough to 
survive uh, life-threatening experiences, whether that be a stroke or cancer or, or whatever, they find themselves uh, getting through. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. That and then being released and being hit with these bills and there are just terrifying numbers of uh, people who then end up going into uh, medically related bankruptcy. So, you know, you, you, you've gone through this terrible experience. You may well uh, have lost a great deal of your earning ability. Uh, the same things may apply to your families who will have caring responsibilities and all that sort of stuff. But then you're looking at bankruptcy and the possibility of losing your home and all that sort of stuff, which is uh, clearly a tragedy. So again, we were, we were very fortunate to have an out, um, have support, be coming into this situation from, from a very privileged sort of situation. So yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's a, grim, a grim possibility. Would you have been able to leave the US to go back to Scotland if you hadn't paid the bill, had you not had cover? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, certainly, I would never have been able to go back to the States. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what, what, what going on the lamb from the US would have looked like, to be honest. I um, mm -hmm. yeah. would like to think there would be some humanitarian uh, ways of looking at that. Yeah, interesting. So, you're, you then went through a recovery, were you left with cognitive deficits? Did you have any issues in that part of your recovery that you needed to overcome? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I think you, you, lots, of, lots of survivors talk about the idea of, uh, you know, the, the new normal, I suppose. It was definitely a period of uh, a couple of years where cognition was was pretty difficult. Uh, I was I was very fortunate again in that um, my stroke hit the 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 right side of my brain, so I have sort of slight left side physical deficits. Um, so, you know, slight lump when I'm tired, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but it meant that my my expressive abilities were, were pretty much untouched. So I was very very fortunate in in that regard. Um, and I feel at this point that um, my cognition is pretty much um, back to where it was. Um, although, you know, at, at this stage, it is the new normal and uh, I'm, I can't be entirely sure. Yeah. Um, before the stroke happened, I was working you know, these, these ridiculous hours and uh, it could be, could be pretty spacey in my, own, in my own real life already. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether I should be um, mad at the stroke or just uh, reflecting on the fact that, oh, still you, Ricky. Um, but it feels like things are, are pretty pretty together at, at, at this point. Okay. Again, very fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Sounds um, it kind of sounds similar to me. I have the deficits on my left side. I get fatigued sometimes if I haven't slept well, which happens from time to time, and then the next day fun it's really difficult to drag myself through it uh, i i'll i'll be a little more uh, unsteady on my feet you know i might bump into the odd doorway um uh 
you know, I'll have a, I'll have some pain in my legs and in my, in my leg and in my extremities uh, on the left side. And uh, I'll be a bit, uh, I'll be a bit angrier and nastier yeah. uh, without yeah. knowing that I'm being that way at the time. And then I have to apologize and do all that stuff, which is fine. Uh, but it sounds like my journey has kind of got me to the point where I'm now pretty capable of sitting down, for example, recording multiple podcasts on a day, you know, going through the editing process, doing that, which is far further along than what I have been uh, perhaps maybe for the first six or seven years after the first incident and then and then and then after the second and third incident so i'm really able to reflect on how far i've come and i'm really comfortable with being able to say hey look how far you've come you know and even though you've had two or three bad days last week or there's another two or three bad days coming that's okay that's like take your wins and rest 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 and just overcome whatever uh whatever challenges you have and try not to do so much so uh that's kind of how, to, how i get around being impacted by the stroke still you know 10 years later i just have learned a new way to listen to my body and pay attention and do what it's asking rather than pushing through and then falling into the abyss and then trying you know like mad to find a way out and fighting it and rather than fighting it and just sort of let it ride is that how you go about things? Do you have those types of moments like I described? Well, uh, you're, you're touching on a, a couple of really interesting things that have a degree of universe, universality to them, I think. Sort of learning to recognize your deafness and being able to adopt coping, str coping strategies. You know, you... Uh, you account or a person accounts for um, you know, their deficits and begins to make allowances for that. Um, for me, uh, something that I would have to do, particularly towards the, the beginning of, of, of uh, or the, the beginning of the second stage of my recovery, if you will, uh, would be to try to be more organized. Um, all of the stuff I would ever have to remember or sort of the, the, the physical objects I would have to remember would all go in very particular places and they would always go in those particular places until that was just a, a, a new habit uh, that, had been, that had been very effectively formed. So I'd always be able to find the phone, the keys, the cards, the wallet, all that sort of stuff. Without that particular, and that's a small coping strategy, but without that, all of that stuff would, would have fallen apart on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, and another, uh, and, and also, you know, I, I keep a lot of lists now. I'm really good at calendaring things, which, you know, in, in, in that previous, like, it, it was just, you know, just get from one thing to the next thing. Just keep going, get it done. Now things are a little bit more, more organized. And another thing I think that I recognize in, in a lot of the things that you, you've been, been talking about here is um, having gone through this, these experiences, um, I think, Firstly, I found myself um, having a, a different set of priorities. I sort of take my health more seriously, but also um, I mean, I've, I've, I've taken up meditation, for example. Um, so I've, I've got a much more sort of a together, um, sort of generous outlook on my own life and on other people and all that sort of stuff. One of the, I, my um, recreational therapist uh, in the hospital came by one day and sort of gave me these, um, remember CDs? She gave me these mindfulness CDs. Wow. Um, and I, I started using them. That had always been something that I'd sort of um, been interested in, but uh, had never had either the, the opportunity or the motivation to really follow, follow through on. Uh, but I find that's been something that's been been helpful for me uh, as well. But I, I, I think there's a there's a natural aspect to that that comes through just having gone through these things. You know, I, I think a lot of survivors do find themselves reevaluating a lot of stuff and having a little bit more of a, for lack of a better word, 
uh, holistic and also empathetic um, outlook on life. You know, where it's, again, being able to look at it from a, a position where I've been very fortunate. I have these little superpowers that I've kind of picked up on the way, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, going through, uh, well, I think of my father again, he and his, one of his pals used to talk about the fact that one of the reasons that they had had reasonably long and healthy lives was because they had had early life health scares and had therefore started to take care of themselves a little better. Yeah. And, uh, they're doing that too. But anyway, I'm, I'm blithering on here. Where are you going next? I love it. I love it. The empathy side of it was interesting because that's something that I got as well that it, that was enhanced in me because immediately, uh, because I spent some time in a wheelchair, immediately mm. I was able to relate to a whole bunch more people in the community and completely and totally understand, uh, use my small amount of time in the wheelchair to understand what the consequences of being in a wheelchair for a long time mean and then also seeing people who were uh, uh living on the street uh, and being able to see that i probably wasn't that far off that because if things went wrong differently for me then i could have been impacted in a way that would have perhaps potentially ended up with me having lots of other misfortunes perhaps and end up in a situation that i didn't plan that was out of the realm of possibility until after this injury with stroke. And I'm like, hmm, okay, I can appreciate those people now. And I know that when they ask for money, I'm not going to wonder what are they going to do with that money. What I'm going to do is give them their few bucks and let them work out what they're going to do with it. And hopefully that lets them do something that gets them to the point where they no longer have to be on the street at some point in time in their life, whatever. And it's like... It's such a blessing to have that where before I thought that I had the answer to everything. I thought that I knew it all and I judged people uh, based on my very small, uh, my, my, my lack of life's experiences and my very narrow uh, focus with regards to the realm of possibilities for other people. And um, it was eye-opening so eye-opening and it's made my life richer for knowing that because i've interacted with people who i never would have interacted with before who have just been themselves and they've gone just by being themselves it has completely dislodged the the stuff that i thought was correct about them which is completely incorrect because I was just making it up from hearsay or from news or from all these unreliable sources about what it means when somebody is living in a certain situation or when somebody is experiencing a certain health condition or whatever the situation may be. And it's like, hmm, okay. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know how else I don't know how else I would have learned those life skills. I have no idea how I would have learned them if there wasn't for that situation. And I'm glad that it happened. Um, yeah. That part, of, that part of it, right? So oh, yeah, of course. I, I get what you're saying. Like I get where you're coming from, the little superpowers. That's exactly what they are. And if somebody listening to this hasn't got, got there yet, yeah. well, discover the superpowers. It's a matter of time. There will be some massive changes that occur that you didn't expect that you'll reflect on and you'll go wow wow that came from this what a unexpected surprise that's never how i would have thought that something so profound that that's how i would have come across it or discovered it it's just yeah i'm, I'm totally amazed by it all the time and what's interesting is that i've moved into writing a book and I've seen how many stroke survivors have moved into writing a book and they've written a book and they've put their story on paper and then they've published and they've got it out. And you became an author. So before you were an author, you were a legal eagle. And then you've turned into this completely different path. Is authorship something that you were passionate about but never did? Or is it something you've discovered? How did you become an author? Um, well, um, 
Beth, Beth asked me the same question. Um, you know, not long after uh, all this went down, and I, I and I I started writing. She said, you know, did did you did you always want to be a writer? And uh, it turned out the answer was yes, but I forgot. Um, I think you know, in, in, as a, as a, this may not be uncommon. But as, a, as a teenager, uh, I had, I wanted to write, and it showed it showed a little bit of um, natural talent, if you will. <clears throat> but uh, you know, just life went went in different directions. But then, um, having woken up, uh, or having you know, sort of regained sort of uh, full consciousness. Um, one of the first things I did was when, I'm, when, I was, when I was granted access to my phone again, which, you know, took a few weeks because, you know, if you're in a bed, that is more than enough room for uh, someone in stroke recovery to, lo to, to lose their phone for, for days at a time. But, uh, but I was able to get um, fuller access to it. One, I, I, my, my outlet or my, my, my sort of connection to the outside world was, uh, was through Twitter. So I started, you know, just putting out these little things about what was happening to me. Um, and you'll have, you'll, have, you'll have come across this, I'm sure, Bill. Um, one of the things that gets a lot of stroke survivors and their loved ones through all these just horrible sort of, you know, blood and pain and just terrible experiences is this weird, absurd black humor. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Beth would talk about how she would, you know, these things would happen and she would want to laugh, but she would feel terrible that I might think she was laughing at me. But, you know, th that, that wasn't, that, that wouldn't have been, and wasn't the case at all. So they would be, it would be just things like, um, I would, I would, you know, I, I was going through my stroke related rage during these uh, initial seven weeks. And I would, I would, um, demand access to a phone so I could speak to my friend Tony Stark, um, who was, you know, Iron Man, right? And he was going to pick up. Um, and then just dumb stuff like, um, they, again, they'd be asking me the memory questions. Uh, you know, what's your name? Do you know where you are? Do you know why you're here? And all that sort of stuff. Um, do you know, do you know who the president is? And I would end up saying something along the lines of, you know, no, I, 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 I don't. I don't, I don't. On one level, I still kind of didn't care. <laughs> and Ben, and Ben would say, "Ask who the prime minister is," and they would say, "Okay, who's the prime minister?" And I would say, "Ah, uh, 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 you hate him." Oh, is it David Cameron? You know that, that, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that, <laughs> sorry. I'm uh, just looking back at some of the, you know, the the, the sort of more fun aspects of what happened um oh and sorry just one other thing what again my my healthcare providers were incredible and there was this one um uh nurse who was who, who was taking care of me who had spent time in edinburgh so we we sort of connected a little bit and all that sort of stuff and um we uh we started sharing um sean connery uh, impressions which I'm okay. I, you can probably imagine, and uh, and then this this tiny little Asian nurse would be. Uh, I, I I I would I, I would you know I I'd be in Goldfinger mode, and it would be and and then this booming Scottish voice would emanate from this little woman. You know, so, show Goldfinger. Do you expect me to die? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know all these little things. So. <laughs> from a, from a. A nurse with Asian heritage who has not the same stature, a the voice, the look of Sean Connery. It would be surreal hearing uh, uh, a Scottish accent as well in that situation. It would be amazing. It was delightful. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of funny things happen during stroke for me as well. And I, I often talk about them in that way as well, that – they actually created a little bit of lightheartedness when it was really possible for things to be really terrible all the time. And we laughed when we had the opportunity to laugh. We laughed because we might not have had that opportunity later. It might never have come. We might not have been, I might not have been around. So it's not like you should, uh, because stroke's serious, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> 
because stroke's serious and uh, devastating and all the things that it is, it doesn't mean you shouldn't find things to laugh at during a seriously devastating time. And you might not be in the mood, and that's okay, um, but if the mood allows it and you can, embrace it. And I think this is one of the reasons that that, that, a, that a number of us do end up writing in, in, in some form or another. Firstly, you, you find that you have a you have a story to tell, but also um, there's a, a desire to sort of uh, share some of this stuff um, because you know not not everyone not everyone is is there yet. So you know these ideas of these little shafts of light, these little moments of hope, if you can sort of push the possibility about for the people who are going to be lucky enough to access those moments, yes. you know, give them a moment to sort of hang on to, that that feels like a very positive thing to do. I think so. I love that. I love that idea that, you know, the people might be listening who are in their very critical, acute stage of recovery and they don't think there's anything funny about it and we're kind of giving them permission to laugh if – a funny situation arises and make it yeah. okay to do that, not feel bad about it, whether they're a caregiver or whether they're the patient or a family member, you know, it's okay to have a bit of a laugh. So go for it. It works and it makes you feel better and it creates endorphins and, and it, you know, gets the whole body uh, changing uh, its physiology and its chemistry a little bit. So do it. It's a positive thing. Um, I love that. So, Tell me about the book uh, that you've written. What's it about, and what, and how long did it take you to get to the end of the whole creative process and then publishing? Yeah. Um, so the the process um, started reasonably reasonably. It started reasonably quickly, uh, as as I say. Um, a lot of the, you know, I, I wasn't making memories, particularly during that sort of first seven-week period. Um, but then sort of rebuilding um, some of these um, events as they happened um, through the fact that I had actually, be, I had actually been tweeting meant that a lot of this stuff had been sort of um, noted in places. So so in that sense, it was, it was almost an immediate thing, but then it started turning into a more, a more mindful sort of a thing. Uh, and as I was in the very initial stages of recovery, I think one of the first things I did was when I was sort of making a, a, a trip on my own on the on the New York subway um, was um, we'd come across this um, sort of writer's workshop in another part of Brooklyn. So that was that, that was a big project. We, we sort of sat down together. We we got on the uh, on the online subway map. We made some notes. We figured out where I would have to change and all that sort of stuff. And I managed to get into a different neighborhood of Brooklyn. And that was a, that was a, that was a huge achievement. That was a real sort of landmark on on recovery. So uh, there were some very supportive people there, and that's kind of where that process began to become something a little bit more real. Um, and then over the next, I mean, it was over. It was over a period of years because um, you know at that point, um, you know, concentration is still difficult, uh, stamina is still difficult, all that sort of thing. Um, but I think I probably started. Uh, well, I mean, I, I had a more or less finished uh, manuscript in um, twenty seventeen. And uh, my publishers for that book, um, Sandstone Press, here in Scotland, and were doing a, they were they were at a an expo of sorts um, in the in the north of Scotland, and they were looking for people to pitch ideas again, as it happens on Twitter. Um, and uh, I you know I had I think at that stage it was probably what still 140 characters, but you know it's a. It, it's it, 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 it's a, it's a crazy story, right? Um, so I, I I condensed it as much as I could and threw it out there, and they were interested. Um, so I had to <laughs> very thin, very very quickly get the, the manuscript a little bit more polished, and was was fortunate enough um, that they that they picked it up. 
Um, and yeah, I, I, again, having stumbled into this sort of story that I felt um, almost obliged to tell because it is such a crazy story and because there are things that you know, we want to pass along. Uh, it, it went on reasonably well. And then in 2019, I think it would have been the year that it sort of uh, hit the world in its final form, um, stroke call on a 5% chance of survival because when they were wheeling me in without blood pressure reading, that was kind of where we are. And in fact, it wasn't survival. It was a 5% chance of uh, survival in a non plegic state. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting into details here. Point being, uh, 2019, um, our, one of our major um, broadsheet newspapers here in Scotland made it one of their uh, Scottish non-fiction books of the year, which was a huge honour, obviously. Um, and that's kind of given me the, um, the opportunity to carry on with a lot of this stuff. I, uh, so I, uh, I, myself and a colleague, we put together um, a, a spoken word night for a couple of years here in Scotland that won some awards. Uh, and I'm very fortunate in that my, um, my first novella comes out um, towards the beginning of next year. So it's exciting times. Unbelievable. I just cannot, I just cannot grasp the amazingness of that. Like, it's amazing because this complete shift that happened all serendipi serendipitously, like it just, you know, emerged. It somehow found you, you found it, they found you, you know, and then the whole thing just kind of emerged. It's amazing. Um, I know that uh, we, we can't ever sort of do justice of maybe how difficult the, the, the middle sections were and the, the doubts and all that yeah. stuff. I imagine there was plenty of them, right? But in the end, it seems like persistence and perseverance were part of what made it possible to deliver this thing and then change your career at the same time and move to a new career. Um, this just desire to continuously go for it and solve little problems as they came up, like how do I get to change trains? Like where do I have to get off? Um, make some notes on uh, the particular presentation that you listen to and so on. Little, uh, little kind of nuggets of solutions and problem solving little, little bits at a time just add up and then before you know it, you know, time flies and things happen and then there's a book and now there's a, another one on the way. Does that encapsulate it a little bit or did I like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you spend so much time getting from day to day, from hour to hour, and then you put them all together and you find you're, you're somewhere different altogether. And as you say, you, it, it's, it, one can't, one mustn't um, downplay the blood and the tears and the snot and the emotional ability and the moments where, and I, I get emotional about it now, but the moments where you're convinced that it, it's not going to work out. There's no way that your partner could possibly stay because look at how awesome they're being and why would they continue to put themselves through that? And, and, and again, I was, I, I was lucky she did. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, and, and, I, and again, I, I think, th and I always, I always find myself acknowledging, acknowledging the huge part that luck has played, but you know, you keep putting yourself out there and you try and give that luck the chance to hit. And now that's, that's another part of, of sort of what was going on. I, I love that. Like to you try and give that that chance for the luck to hit. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Um, basically, it's like you've got to be make, make yourself available so that when lucky things happen, you're around to collect on that uh, lucky situation or lucky episode or chance meeting or whatever it was. If you're not out there, that is definitely not going to happen. The luck is not going to hit because you're not putting yourself out there. Um, you're not making any moves towards this new version of you or whatever it was. I'm trying to get people inspired about doing stuff in spite of not knowing what the outcome is going to be. Just do it anyway and then just see where the luck lands and then take it and go with it and run, run with it. Um, now, 
when I'm when I've got your cover of your book uh, up here on the screen, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the back page, and I'm going to read a little bit about uh, what other people have had to say about it. You know, Katie Welsh, who I don't know, um, says no memoir about major neurological injury should be this funny, as much about navigating adulthood and everything that comes with it as it is about recovery. Um, and then Alison Stack says, by turns funny, philosophical, and morbidly fascinating. Stroke is a wryly humorous meditation on love, the strangeness of life, and the miracle of second chances. And then Professor Sir Kenneth Kalman says, an inspirational story of a young man with a stroke with, fas with a fascinating and unexpected ending. It's, it's, yeah, it feels like another you know, person when you when you hear that sort of stuff. But that that that's all that's all super kind. Um, and again, it's 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 not just me. It's a story. I mean, th th this this is happening. It's, it's something similar's happened to you. It's happened to me. It's it's, it's happened to people who are going to be listening to it and watching this podcast. And uh, yeah, you know, as all these people make their way through this, they are amazing people with amazing stories. Um, you know, I, I got a chance to to, sh to share mine, but uh, yeah, we all have these these amazing individual stories. And I suppose since you're being kind enough to be so kind, I should probably mention that um, the novella that's due to come out um, at the beginning of next year, I think, um, takes takes other uh, other sort of you know real life um, aspects of what's happened to me. And uh, the publishers, um, Leamington Books. Uh, here in in Scotland, are, are running a Kickstarter for something called Novella Express, and there's going to be some amazing talent and content going out there. And if you want to, if you want to find out sort of uh, more about that, all that stuff's out there uh, on the old interwebs. So yeah, we'll have all the links uh, in the show notes where people can go to recoveryafterstroke.com/episodes. I'll be able to have a look at your episode and then download a transcription plus also click on your links uh, for you. that and that'll be awesome uh, for people to go there who are interested and tell me about it about the novella uh, give us a little bit of a glimpse into what people can expect to find in that when it's uh, finally sort uh, finished and, and released yeah uh, well I've always had an interest in um in gothic fiction uh and uh, yeah you know sort of hearing the hearing some of the stories i'm telling you know my, my the, the, the morbid side of my nature has not uh, has not receded uh at all i mean i'm i'm, I'm very positive obviously but uh you know you you, you get the brain you get the brain surgery you, you get the mris there's the, the I, I still have two aneurysms actually so you know i i i, I do have you know those 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 threats living inside me so uh -huh. um it's a it, it's a gothic novella and it actually goes it, it's set in uh, a place where i had some of my recovery uh, we have friends who have a small uh farm in rural pennsylvania and they were kind enough to let me spend some time uh recovering there and um I mean, you, you you'll know this where you live. It's it's something that's sort of less um, evident when you're living in in Edinburgh here in Scotland. But um, you know, if you're in sort of a rural part of America, there's just these huge areas of land, and and this farm is surrounded by by trees, and um, there's something a little spooky about it. So um, we have so it, 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 it's the story of um, a professional couple who lose their jobs and have to to leave New York City for um, a farm and, uh, a, 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 and a spooky forest. And um, yeah, one of them dies and we have to spend the, the length of a novella figuring out why and how that happened. And it's about regret and loss and memory and all these things that um, stroke survivors think about a lot of the time. I hear you. I hear you. Wow, sounds like an interesting book, uh, okay. and that'll be fantastic when it's out. Well, I really appreciate you reaching out, uh, joining me on the podcast, and sharing your story. Um, I do like the way that you're very uh, uh, 
you're underplaying this whole thing and you've done it from the very beginning of our podcast episode. Um, I like it because it's, it's nice that you're doing it, but I'm going to give you a little bit more credit for being here because the circumstances under which you are here are extraordinary. Absolutely. And um, it's just like a celebration of you. Yeah. This is like you're here under the most hostile conditions. You made it to the other side and that's bloody awesome. And I'm so I get so excited when people are on my podcast because that means we all kind of made it, right? And that's awesome. So it's a bit of a me understanding why you're downplaying things, but then me also going, all right, I know you're humble, but I love it that you're here. 300, you, you know, you broke a record for me. I never heard of 300 blood pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, man. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and reaching out um, and sharing your story. And uh, I really look forward to um, learning more about your book as it comes out. When it does come out, please, please reach out so we can talk about it again and so we can be on the podcast okay. again. That'd be fun. And, um, yeah, just thank you. No, oh, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to share the story with some people. And, and thanks to you for sort of uh, – given the opportunity to sort of access some of these stories. And uh, yeah, it's someone give Beth a, a, a post-it note um, during my recovery saying nothing, none of, nothing is permanent. So yeah, keep on keeping on, folks. It's been a, a real pleasure to, to have Bill give me a chance to speak to you. Cheers. Thanks for joining us on today's episode to learn more about my guests, including their links to social media and other pages, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you are watching on YouTube, comment below the video, like the episode, and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show, and also hit the notifications bell so you can be notified of new episodes as they are made available. Now, sharing the show with family and friends on social media will make it possible for people who may need this type of content to find it easier, and they may make a massive difference to someone that is on the road to recovery after their own experience with stroke. Thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you and see you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease for therapy purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency, or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk, and we are not responsible for any information you find there.